Steve, first of all, let me just say, big, big fan of your work. This is a huge honor to have you on the show and get a chance to talk to you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Our show is all about going back and reliving the childhood. I started the show because I love my childhood so much. And yeah. I like to talk to people that helped mold my childhood, which oh. you are one of those people. So oh, wow. okay. t- sure. tell me a little bit about your childhood. What was your childhood like? You were a Southern boy, right? I'm from Atlanta originally. I grew up here my whole life. I'm there. I'm in Atlanta now. Um, I had uh, one younger brother who's three years younger than me. So we were really the best of friends. We played together all the time. We were each other's playmates as well as brothers. And, um, oh, I, you know, we grew up in the 60s. We were both, he was born in the early 60s. I was in the late 50s. And all of the culture that was going on at that time frame really affected us greatly. Uh, things like, you know, well, the Muppets is an obvious one, I guess, because that's when Jim was getting his start. Yeah. But there were so many other things too. Um, you know, the original, I guess it's, I, I call it the original, uh, Adam West Batman was a huge influence. You know, I was 10 years old when that came on television. So massive fan of that. Um, things like Rowan and Martin's laugh in, you know, which wasn't yep. a kid's show particularly, but the, the format of that show, the peanuts characters were a huge oh, yeah. influence. On oh, me. Yeah. You know, I loved, loved those early peanut specials. Um, and of course, you know, as you know, I mean, there was, obviously there was no internet then and there were only about four <laughs> uh, channels you could watch, you know? So when these things were coming on television, television specials or shows, you really planned your, your day and your evening and your, and an event around it. Um, especially on specials like the peanut specials or yep. a Muppet special. Uh, you really waited for those things. Oh yeah. I, I'm not that young. I mean, I'm, I'm 40 younger than you, yeah, but yeah. yeah, of course I grew up with the uh, same idea of looking at the TV guide and marking out what you want to watch uh-huh. and no DVR. So you had to be either no. you can set the VCR, I guess, but right. who, how many right. people really set the VCR? You know, everybody's was on uh-huh. t- um, blinking on, on 12 o'clock cause nobody set the VCR. That's so, right. I thought I, I had this great idea for like when when DVD players came out to make a little fake thing you could stick on the front that was a flashing <laughs> clock, you know, just for old time's sake. <laughs> I would have bought that. I would have definitely bought that. <laughs> so, so being the Southern boy that you were, I'm sure you, ex- yeah. you know, enjoyed yourself outside in the outdoors and the old Southern food and all. Oh, for sure. Um, my maternal grandmother, who we called mom because we grew up calling her that because my mother called her mom. Um, was this wonderful lady who was a great cook and really loved, you know, food was love. I mean, that's the South, food was love, you know? So, so eating was a big part of that and all the Southern food, you know, everything. Oh, I mean, yeah. I, and I still love it, I still love it. I, you know, I try to temper what I eat a little bit more these days. Some of it's not <laughs> the best for you, but I have such a sweet tooth from those days, it still affects yeah. me. <laughs> I, I moved to the South, I, I used to, so I'm from Reno, Nevada. And uh-huh. when I was 13, we all moved to the Panhandle of Florida. Oh, wow. So okay. I got to experience the whole culture shock, which is major coming from the West Coast. Sure. And the food sure. experience. That's when I learned if you wanted to order unsweet tea, you had to say mm. unsweet tea. Because in right. the West Coast, you're going to say iced tea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, otherwise, it, it, yeah, anything here is, I mean, some people say sweet tea. But but really, tea is sweet tea. It, is. it certainly was back in those days. Oh, yeah. yeah. I remember ordering... Even when you order unsweet tea in the South, they still come with a whole packet of sugar with a spoon, uh-huh. thinking you're gonna make your own sweet tea because they're yeah, they just they just think you don't trust them, exactly. you know, to get it right. <laughs> but they understand exactly. It's, like, you know, it's, it's funny about that too. It's, it's the same with mayonnaise. Mayonnaise is a big thing in the South. It is. It you know, is. everybody has their favorites, either Kraft or Hellman's, are yeah. the two that I'm most familiar with. And you either, you know, it's really divided. I mean, it's like, you know, it's almost like an election. You know, you, you vote for the one. You got your one, you know. Yeah, it's funny you say that because one of my closest friends, Scott, um, he used to put dip his pizza in mayonnaise. It's like, what oh, are you wow. what are you doing? <laughs> but it's a southern thing, I guess. I think it is. That mayonnaise goes in or on a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> All right. So, and you got your um, puppetry interest by watching Sesame Street. Is that right? Well, kind of. Yeah, that was what really uh, sort of gelled it for me. I <clears throat> I really remember the Muppets from maybe being five or six years old. You know, Jim started, one of the first things he did was Rolf the Dog on yeah. the Jimmy Dean show back in the early 60s. And I would have been about five or six years old, I guess. And um, I, 
I seem to recall that my parents sort of let me stay up later than usual to watch the Jimmy Dean show because Rolf the dog was going to be on there. And I, and my recollection, I mean, I didn't overthink it much at five or six years old, but I seem to recall realizing that it was not real. It was a toy. It was a puppet, you know, but I was amazed by the fact that it seemed so alive. Yeah. Uh, even at that age, I remember that feeling and Rolf in particular, it was black and white television. So Rolf was this dark brown dog with a big black uh -huh. mouth. And when he opened his mouth, it was as though I thought, well, that must be how they get inside of him. Wow. He must go in through the mouth, you know, because <laughs> um, it looked like a big hole. Um, so Rolf was a big influence on me at that age. And I didn't know Kermit until some years later when Jim started doing some television specials. But once Sesame Street happened and, and the Muppets were on television every single day, um, I just became very obsessed with everything about it. I mean, the characters, the fact that these people seem to be having such an enormously good time mm -hmm. doing what they were doing, as well as trying to figure out how they worked and how to build them. I was 10 years old at that point. So I was at that point where I was very interested in the construction of them. Yeah. Um, so that was really when it all happened to me. Sesame Street was what made me think I really like to do this. Awesome. I heard you even made your own Kermit as a kid. I did. I met the first one was uh, extremely crude. I was, I was very drawn to Jim's characters early on, you know, really from the Sesame street years, Ernie and Kermit. And, um, I soon got to the point where I could kind of, well, it, you know, I would, I would turn this, I would do this just for fun. I would turn, I would turn the volume down on the television and I could tell which puppeteer was performing which character by the style of the way they wow. manipulated the characters. Uh, I, I was truly obsessed. I mean, I was really obsessed with this. <laughs> uh, and the first Kermit I ever made, I had I'd never sewn anything. I didn't know how to make anything out of fabric. Yeah. So I tried making Kermit out of a, you know, the pot pie metal tins. Of course, yeah. So that was like the shape of the top of the head. And I stapled a mouth in around one edge <laughs> and painted it green. It was horrible, it was horrible. But it was a first shot, you know, it was first thinking, okay, the mouth needs to work and it has to have eyes and, you know. <laughs> I wish we had that in a museum. That would be amazing. Oh my God. Yeah, I'm sure it's long gone. <laughs> <laughs> in the garbage, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. And I even heard that, this might not be true. I found it online, so it might not be true. I heard that okay. your nickname back then was Kermit. Well, later it was. When I was in high school, uh, people started calling me Kermit because by then I really was trying to make the the, the characters. Okay. I mean, I made, I, I duplicated some of the Muppet characters, but I was really starting to try to get into making some things of my own too. Um, but because I loved Kermit so much, I did make a Kermit and, and I would do these high school assemblies, you know, like choral recitals and things. And they wow. would always have me MC <laughs> the shows and ad lib all that, you know? So, uh, you know, I became known as Kermit just, just because of that purpose. <laughs> just, just think going back in time, talking to your past self, knowing yeah. that you'll become Kermit one day. That's just remarkable. It, yeah. I, I mean, I don't think I had any inclination or ambition towards anything like that. It just, that was not even on the radar. Yeah. You know, yeah. I knew I loved doing the puppetry and I knew it was my little niche I carved out within my social group at school. You know, I was the nerdy puppet guy, but the nerdy <laughs> part was okay. And, uh, you know, the idea of working with Jim was not something that was really on my mind. I mean, I was doing this and I wanted to do this, but I thought, you know, I hope to meet Jim Henson someday, but really wasn't about getting a job per se. Yeah. You know? Tell me about that first interaction. The first time you met Jim, what was that like? Well, it was strange because uh, I was about 18 or 19 years old and, and slight little bit of backstory. I had gotten a, an audition tape to Jim through his wife, Jane. They had asked for me to do this tape and he was in the middle of the Muppet show. So, he had called me at home. I was living with my parents, of course. And he said, uh, he said, I don't know. He saw this tape and he said, I don't know what you'll be doing, but I can tell you that I will definitely give you a job. Um, and I, you know, a month before I wasn't even looking for that. And it sort of just happened. <laughs> wow. So the meeting with Jim was that he flew me to New York in the winter of, I guess, 1977. It was like December, late November, early December. Freezing, freezing cold, especially for a guy from the South who didn't even own a winter coat. <laughs> and I showed up in New York and I had my little trunk full of puppets. And, you know, I was scared to death of New York City. I mean, it was. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I hadn't, I, hadn't, I hadn't been to a city like New York. So I just stayed in the hotel until the next morning. and was supposed to show up at Muppets at some point. Um, 
So I, when I finally got there, I um, got out with my little trunk full of puppets. There was snow piled up against the buildings over six feet high. It was the worst <laughs> winter on record in, in a decade at that point. Um, so I go up and, I, and, and above the door was this little tiny, tiny, and I'm talking like an inch high little strip that said Henson Associates. So it was complete. It was almost like it was this covert place, you know? So I, I hit this buzzer that looked like a doorbell. There was nothing happened that I could tell. And then all of a sudden there was this loud buzzing. Well, I'd never encountered one of those doors where somebody buzzes you in before. So I, I didn't do anything. I just stood there. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't know I was supposed to pull the door. Uh -huh. uh, so this, this happened about four times. And, uh, and finally, you know, I, I, I thought I'd set up an alarm or something. So the door flies open and the sun hits this person in the face. I'm behind the door as it opens. And it was Jim Henson. And he steps out and his hair's kind of mussed up and his clothes are a little wrinkled and he has a broom in his hand. And he was sweeping the stairs that led this huge staircase that led up to the third floor. He had spent the night there, as it turns out, overnight, worked late, stayed wow. there. And the sun hit his eyes and he kind of squinted and he looks at this 19-year-old kid. And I, <laughs> I just said, hi, you know, <laughs> hi. And uh, he said, hi, can, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm Steve Whitmer. I'm puppeteer. I'm supposed to be here. Of course, I knew it was Jim Henson. He had no yeah. idea who I was. Yeah. And he said, oh, right. OK, well, come on in. So it's freezing. So I go inside and I'm following up the steps. He's still sweeping the steps as we go up the steps. <laughs> He's like five steps ahead. And he said, um, you know, I we we really don't normally get things started around here quite this early. Uh, you know, we weren't quite expecting you here this early. It was like eight o'clock in the morning because I had nothing else to do. I'm in New York. I mean, I, I'm scared to death. I just want to meet Jim Henson. And I, trying to be the perfect you know, person here, I said, well, maybe I should just go away uh, and come back a little later, hoping to God he didn't yeah. say yes to that. Yeah. He said, yeah, that might be a good idea. So, <laughs> so I left my trunk full of puppets and I went away for two hours, came, he said, come back about 10, 1030. So I had two hours to kill in New York with no money, freezing with no place to go. <laughs> uh, of course I did it because that's what you do, you know. Yeah. Uh, but that was the very first meeting and, and I spent about three days with him Jim's idea of an audition was put on puppets for a few minutes and see what this, see if this person has any potential. And then all the rest of the time was spent talking and getting to know each other because I think what was just as important to Jim was whether or not this new person was going to fit into his little core group of people. Yep, absolutely. And I guess he, I don't, it took me a while, but I think he must have seen the potential for that. I guess so. <laughs> I got to say there, there's two people in the business that I just admire. Two people that I would want to meet. I can't, of course. First one would be Walt Disney. Second yeah, one, yeah. Jim Henson. Mm -hmm. So just yeah. that you got to work with Jim, the, the man, you know, just is remarkable. Was there ever a moment where you just geeked out in, internally when you were working oh, with I him? I think I spent about the first, the first five to seven years doing that. Oh, yeah. Um, almost constantly. I mean, even once I felt like I was kind of a part of Jim's group, I was going to be there. He was going to keep hiring me. I was going to keep coming in. I was still in awe of Jim for a lot of years. And uh, it, it's sort of, unfortunately, I mean, it's a semi-regret. I was just getting to the point about two to three years before Jim passed away uh, that we were getting to a point where I was no longer a child putting this hero on a pedestal. I was really, we were starting to get more of an adult relationship. Yeah. And he was starting to have discussions with me about things he had tried to have before, which I had no understanding of. Yeah. Like, you know, production. And he wanted me, he talked to me about directing and doing a lot of things like that. Wow. Um, you know, the future, where, where he was going, what we were going to do, what he wanted me to do, how he wanted me to be involved, things like that. I heard there's even a time where he talked to you about voicing taken over as Kermit before he'd pass. Is that true? We, we never spoke about that. You didn't? Okay. It was, it was never mentioned. Um, and, and apparently what happened was it, that it was not like he had planned on me taking over Kermit. Um, at, the, at the time of his death in 1990, he was looking to sell his company to Disney. Yeah. Um, and at that point, he was selling the whole company. I mean, everything, the Jim Henson company would have been like Pixar. It would have been under yep. Disney. Um, and I think... You know, he was coming into Disney very much like a um, like John Lasseter with with Pixar. Yeah. He was going to be this new creative force within Disney. And he felt that he might not have time to continue to perform as much. 
And so he knew that Kermit was going to go on. Kermit would be a big, important thing for Disney. So he had said to Jane Henson, his wife, and to, I think, Frank Oz and maybe another person or two, that um, if he became too busy to do Kermit, he was thinking about asking me to give it a try. Awesome. So that was the indicator. It wasn't like there were plans for that. Yeah. And as a result of that, we didn't speak directly about it. Yeah. That's exactly what happened with Mickey Mouse and Walt Disney. You know, he got yeah. too too busy to voice Walt, so he went on to somebody who worked for the company and had him voice Di yeah. um, Mickey Mouse for a while. So. Yeah, and I wonder if Jim, you know, Jim was a big fan of Disney, and I yeah. wonder if that might, if that story might have had That's some true. bearing on that. Yeah, it, it really, very similar stories between the two of those. Well, Jim was very much someone who was always looking for whatever the next thing was going to be. Um, you know, he didn't he didn't dwell in on the past work very much. Um, and, and while he loved the Muppets and he wanted to see them taken care of, I think he was really ready at that stage of his life. He was in his early fifties to move on. He had a lot yeah. of things he wanted to do. And he was hoping that being a part of Disney would help facilitate that and give the Muppets a, a, a place to, you know, be as well. Yeah. Platform. Yeah. Before we can continue on about Jim and everything, yeah. I got to say Rizzo the rat, he uh -huh. is easily probably one of my favorite characters of all time honestly and uh, of course you're Rizzo tell me about well, the creation of Rizzo Rizzo is uh, it's funny you should say that because Rizzo is the favorite character of mine that I ever performed. awesome um I had more fun with Rizzo just being silly and playing yeah. and, and you know there's a certain freedom that comes with a character that you create that I, you know that I create on my own exactly and Rizzo was always my guy and I, I did Rizzo for a long long time um, and I loved doing Kermit. It, it was, but it was more, it was, it was, there was a certain responsibility that went with Kermit to try to make it very true to yep. Jim. Um, and yet not make it just a carbon copy of Jim. You know, I needed to, he needed to grow, which was extremely important. But Rizzo was something that because it came from me and he was much more sarcastic and, and, and uh, edgy and fun, you know, I could just, um, you know, I, I could be a little bit less respectful of Rizzo because whatever I did was going to be Rizzo. You know what exactly. I mean? Uh, and Rizzo grew quite a bit. He started out as a as this rat puppet who was a an old tattered puppet that was stuck in a box somewhere. And he had no voice for about the first two. Well, I was going to say two years. We did we did shoot something with him early on on one of the Muppet shows where he had a lot of dialogue. But it was a very different character because I had no idea what I was doing. Hmm. I, I came into puppetry not as an actor at all. I was very young and I hadn't acted per se. I had had a lot of puppet manipulation experience. So puppeteering, I, I could pick up, you know, but in terms of the performance or character development, all that sort of stuff, I had no experience. Yeah. Um, I could ad lib, but that's about it. So when it came time to do Rizzo, he was meant to be the leader of this union of, of working rats on the Muppet show. He's supposed to be this tough guy. And he was surrounded by all these other rats played by people like Jerry Nelson and Richard Hunt and other performers who were incredibly strong performers. And Rizzo, I couldn't compete with that at all. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't get in there and be as strong as I needed to be as Rizzo because they were, they were just in so strong. Yeah. And you were so young, asked, right? You were like 18 years old, you said, right? 18 or 19. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. I had no experience. I mean, Rizzo had no New York accent. Like he kind of developed into me his bad New York accent. And uh, that was, that came about four or five years down wow. the road. Uh, and I probably learned that from Jerry and Richard as much as anything, because they had that accent down so well, you know, they spent a lot of time in New York and they were great actors. Uh, so Rizzo's sort of, his, his development had a lot to do with, with borrowing from other performers, which is always the case, yeah. you know. And when it came to the, the puppet itself, did you yeah. get to mold that around or was it something pre-made? Well, we started out with this really terrible puppet that had been made uh, as a background puppet for, for a, an, a special Jim had done. And then um, when Jim decided that, you know, he was going to give Rizzo to me as a character, we were going to name him, have a character. Um, he asked me if I wanted to redesign it, rebuild it. And I worked with a puppet builder named Jane Gutnick, who's a longtime Muppet person, still working with the Muppets. And we basically rebuilt him from the ground up. I mean, redesigned the mechanism so I could get my hand inside of him before he was on a long stick. Okay. Uh, so he had a lot more control and and uh, made him into what he basically stayed as. Yeah. And I, I think he really shines in uh, one of my favorites, uh, the Muppet Christmas Carol. He really shines in that movie. 
Yeah, I love that film for Riz, Gonzo and Rizzo together. Oh, yeah. As well as for uh, Treasure Island. Both those films are great. It was nice to see those two characters paired off because Dave and I love working together so much. And yeah. we did a number of character pairings together over the years. Um, and, and we always seem to play well off of each other. So Gonzo and Rizzo did as well. Yeah. No, they they truly make that movie to me because, you know, I was a huge Gonzo fan. He's I think I, he was my second favorite you know, Muppet growing up, Gonzo was just one of my favorites. So it's cool to see the two of them side by side. Yeah, and it's funny about Christmas Carol because um, Gonzo was playing Charles Dickens and he was basically, most of his lines were right out of, of the original story, yeah. out of the original book. Um, Gonzo, <clears throat> who had been kind of the insane one, became the straight man in a way. Yep. Rizzo was yep. more the silly one <laughs> playing off of Gonzo. So after that, we sort of made a conscious decision to try to let Gonzo be a little bit crazier because we made him very, very straight, uh -huh. you know, for that role. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a good thing because he is definitely at his best when he's crazy. That's oh, sure. I think so. I think so. It's almost better if Rizzo's the straight man in a way of the two of them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so that would have been your first big time taking over as Kermit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Christmas Carol was that time. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a, a, an interesting experience. Um, I had barely scratched the surface of Kermit. And yet, you know, it's a funny thing. At the same time, I had worked closely with Jim for about a dozen years, a little longer than that at that point. And so really what gave Kermit to me in any significant way was the relationship with Jim. Um, it would have been entirely impossible for me to do yeah. anything with Kermit had I not known Jim because it gave me a, a comparison of what parts of Jim did he put into Kermit. You yeah. know? And, and there was a lot of that, a lot of crossover. Uh, so that was very helpful. Now, earlier you said Kermit had to grow after Jim's passing and everything. What did you try to do to Kermit to kind of have him grow, to, give, to, to make him kind of your own character? You know, it's, it's, an, it's interesting because I... I, about that time, I wandered into this sort of, I won't get into it in detail, but uh, this field of study that's called integral practice. And what, basically, very long story short, it's just about trying to integrate all these different disciplines in life together into one package without excluding a lot of stuff. And they talk a lot about evolution and the evolution of a thing. Uh -huh. Fit right into Kermit, because Kermit yeah. needed to yeah, evolve. evolve. Yep. And one of the things I walked away from from that um, was that evolution, the, the true definition of evolution is that things transcend what they were before, but they also include what they were before Yeah, to a large degree. They need to grow, but they need to be based on a solid foundation. Otherwise, it's not real evolution. They're not evolving. You're just changing them into something else. Yep. So... It was really about relying as much as I could on my memories of what it was like to stand next to Jim when he was performing Kermit. Um, and, and once I was able to get some handle on those basic things, because they, they came from an instinctual place and because they came from a place of remembrance of the man, I could allow those to gently start to grow and not really change, but just grow you know, grow from what Jim was doing into other things. There, there were other movements that I added to Kermit that Jim really didn't do. Um, in some ways, sometimes Kermit's manipulation of the character got more compact and economical and smaller. Uh -huh. um, we, we concentrated a lot more after that, that time frame on Kermit's personal life, you know, and Miss Piggy's personal life and who they were outside of the projects that they do. Um, so since they became these living being, uh, living, breathing entities in our world, they had to live in the world. So there were, there were physics involved. So they were more organic. They, were, they breathed. And, you know, we didn't blow them up quite as much. You know, we true. still did. But you know what I mean? We, 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 were, we were conscious of the fact that they, they sort of had blood in their veins. Yeah, that's true. Degree. I never thought about that way. Yeah, we tried to, we tried to find, I always tried to find a balance because I didn't want Kermit to become just this stale talking head. I wanted him to have the zaniness and the whimsy that he'd always had. Yeah. But he couldn't do that on the Today Show. You know, he had to sit there and talk. Yep. Uh, he couldn't be quite as silly when he's being a guy being interviewed. So we, <laughs> I tried to look for that balance. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I never thought of it that way, how he really doesn't get blown up as much as he did like on The Muppet Show or, right. you know, things shortly after that. That's awesome. 
I, and, and frankly, I'm in favor of him getting blown up more. I think I think we got to go back to you know we should go back to more of that. You know, if I oh. were if I were still there, that's what I would do. Oh, I'd the, blow him up. the Muppet Show. Was, the Muppet Show was so good. I love the Muppet yeah, Show, yeah. man. It was such a it good was. show. Tell me, I know we're going back now, but tell me about that show. I mean, a lot of huge A-list stars are on that show. Did any of them kind of stand out for you while you worked on it? Well, you know, we had um, there were 120 episodes. I came in about halfway through the five seasons, so that would have been. I guess I probably did 60 episodes yeah. or so. Yeah. And every week we had a different huge star. And by the time I got there, they really were huge stars. Yeah. You know, people who were very well known. And I mean, a lot of them stood out. Um, we worked, you know, Star Wars was huge. It was just happening. The original Star Wars. Yep. So we worked with Mark Hamill and Peter Mayhew and, and all those guys, you know, uh, Tony Daniels, who was in C-3PO. And all those guys came on The Muppet Show. And um, that was a big one. Um, but some of the golden age of Hollywood stars really stood out for me, like Bob Hope and, yeah. and Roy Rogers and Dale Evans and, you know, people like that. Um, yeah, Danny Kaye. I remember Danny Kaye being on an episode. Danny and, Kaye and Gene Kelly. Yeah, man. And Liza Minnelli, you know, all these amazing people. Uh, yeah. I certainly would have never had any opportunity to run across those people yeah. in my life <laughs> that I know of, you know, without, a, without the Muppet Show. It's, and of course I was only 19. I know. So I was an awkward kid trying to find my place <laughs> in the world, you know, yep. but, uh, but everyone, you know, I don't recall a single guest star on that show that wasn't happy to be there. That's and awesome. And in many cases thrilled to be there. That's because I was, you know? you know, I don't want to ask that because I don't want to hear negativity and you don't want to talk about negative times, you know, but it's I, I don't good think to hear. I we had any on the Muppet Show. I, I don't think we ever had a star who came in and just didn't want to be there, you know. They, they, they oftentimes were allowed to come in. I mean, not allowed. They were asked, what is the thing that, what is your, we know you're a singer. What was the thing you'd like to do that people don't know about you? What's the silly thing? And, and uh, they brought it into the show. They got to do things <laughs> that they would never do anywhere oh, else. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. <laughs> it, it, when they came in, when celebrities came in or any guests came in, do they just treat the Muppets like they're a true character? Mm -hmm. Like there's no puppeteer behind them? Well, yes and no. Um, there were some some celebrities who came in who immediately were able to just relate directly to this puppet. They would turn and they would talk to the puppet. There were some, and, and the opposite extreme of that were celebrities who would occasionally, they'd like look beyond the puppet, they'd be looking at us. Okay, that's below. what I was wondering, yeah. It was a little, a little hard to relate to this inanimate object. You know, you, you couldn't tell that on the show, but... Um, yeah, I think I think it ran the gamut of that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that brings to mind one of my favorite little kids on Sesame Street. You may have worked on it during this time. Do you remember the little girl Joey that worked um, a couple episodes of Sesame oh, Street? Oh, is that the one with Kermit? With Kermit, she just that was pre. That was way pre me. I was a kid okay. I was, was wondering. That's what I was wondering. But little blonde girl, right? Yeah, and she she I'm says, sure you and, exactly. Yeah, yeah she. Um, they're doing the alphabet together, and she's yeah. just treating that treating Kermit like it's a true character. I haven't heard that yeah. Jim is right there underneath her and yeah. she's not even looking at Jim. Right. Right. That, that's exactly right. She, uh, you know, kids are really good that way. We, we would do appearances, different things, you know, and, and, and parents would come backstage or, you know, the people who worked on the show and they would say, I really wanted to bring my kids to meet Kermit today, but I was afraid it would ruin the magic. And I would, I usually didn't say it, but, I would always think, you know what? It doesn't do that at all, not yeah. the kids. They, there was almost never a time when any child minded that there was a puppeteer sitting there. They just talked to the character. I, I think in a funny sort of way, they might relate it to when they play with their own toys. Yeah. You know, it was just, they, they would make their toys talk. Exactly. And, That's and so, so true. As a guy sitting there making Kermit talk. <laughs> once in a while, a, a kid, when you get to about eight or nine, they're getting a little older, they'd say, it's you talking. And Kermit would say, yeah, it's him, but... You know, who cares? He's not very interesting. Or, you know, whatever. You know. Wow. <laughs> All right, so let's go back back forward now to Christmas. Uh, Michael Caine, one of the greatest actors that I remember loving. I still uh, love today. He was a great actor today. What was yeah. he like on the set? You know, he played Scrooge quite uh, straight and seriously. Um, and it kind of needed to be that way. He, he did a couple of silly moments, but almost nothing. Everything was pretty much this mean guy. And therefore the Muppets were able to play off of that threat quite well. Yeah. Um, if he had played a goofy version of it, then I don't think the film would have worked at no. all. And I think it's one of the best versions of Christmas Carol ever. I think so too, honestly. That and Mickey's Christmas Carol are my two favorites. Yeah, and, and, and yet one thing I recall with Michael Caine was that 
the time I saw him laugh the hardest was when he was shooting with Beaker, because uh, wow. I was doing Beaker at that point, and we were between takes, and I, I'm just I'm just kind of sitting there with Beaker, and he looked down at Beaker, and he had a little smirk. Uh, he didn't play off of Beaker that way in the film, but he looked at Beaker and he said something, and I and Beaker just sort of looked at him and went, nee, 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 <laughs> and he cracked up. <laughs> He just cracked up. He loved that, that Beaker was saying things, even though Beaker wasn't yeah. saying anything. You know? <laughs> oh, I wish that was on the film. Of course, it wouldn't well, have Michael, fit, like you said. So I know. He, he made me, I really upped my game to work with Michael Caine because I, um, I was nervous about that film to some degree anyway, because it was the first big Kermit thing I was doing. And I knew it was important that it be faithful. Um, but the other part was that oftentimes when we shoot, we would cheat and have our scripts posted on either uh -huh. side of the monitor so we could refer. We didn't have to necessarily learn our lines. It was always a good idea, but you, had, you didn't have to learn it. You could play, you, know, you could cheat. So, but I thought before I went over to do the film, I thought, well, this is Michael Caine. My God, he's going to come in completely prepared. He's an incredible actor. I need to. And so I learned all my lines. Wow. Um, and the only way I got away with it was that because it was, largely the actual dickens novel true there were no rewrites so so i had plenty of time to actually learn them and they didn't you know hand me something on the day and say okay we've changed your lines wow you know? <laughs> there's a uh, another show that i loved um dinosaurs i didn't know you're part of dinosaurs until recently and you were a big part of dinosaurs well we were it was a, a, a truly an ensemble cast i mean there were so many people and it's hard to take credit for a character on that show because every one of the, the dinosaurs took multiple people to True, yeah. So, so, you know, some of us, we thought we might be, you might call them the lead performer because they did the dialogue and they ran the mouth. But, but the, because they were mechanical, we had these incredibly talented actors that they referred to as suit performers who were inside of those things. Uh, and I got to work with a terrific guy named Leif Tilden, who was also one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yes, and, um, okay. Many other things. He's puppeteered with us some, um, but we communicated through these little walkie-talkie kind of, you know, talkback things. We, I had him in my ear, and um, he had me in his ear, and you know, as I was doing the lines, and I'm running the face and the mouth, and sometimes another puppeteer would like do eyes while I'm doing uh -huh. the mouth, and then the voices were actually dubbed after the fact. So other actors, they wanted actors who were well-known names yep. to do the voices, yep. so. You know, we did the voices and we we kind of had to set the performance to a certain extent because we were shooting the thing beforehand. Yeah. Um, so they had to play off what you guys gave them a little bit. Yeah. I mean, they could alter it some. But, um, you know, it was a, it was a very complicated show and really a tough shoot. Oh, I bet. But I but the state of the art kind of thing that I you know, it was well written, really smart and, and so many good things about it. You know, yeah, I think it's now did this start production before Jim passed or after Jim passed? Well, I think the concept was under development from Jim. Okay, because it, it feels then, very much like a Jim idea. You know what I mean? The more serious, more adult-oriented comedy. Yes. So I, he yeah. would have loved the outcome of, of the show, I think. Oh, I think he would have. And I, and I think um, he, I, he would have loved it. And, and, you know, to see it develop into something that actually worked. It's a very odd time, you know, because... <laughs> I mean, I can laugh about this. It, it sounds negative, but, but it was just this odd thing. During the time... So Jim passed away. We're doing dinosaurs and there was all this deal stuff going on. You know, is the company going to Disney? Is it not going yeah. to Disney? What's going to happen? And so both companies were actually suing each other while we were making a program together. <laughs> it was very <laughs> weird. And yet, you know, everything worked out okay. Uh -huh. But I mean, but that's business, you know. Yeah. But it was just a strange feeling, you know, because we had Disney people on the set and the <laughs> Muppet people on the set and the production people, you know. And it's, it's you know, you would have thought it would have been very tense. Yeah. But quite frankly, it, it really wasn't. I mean, we just did the show. Wow. It's like going through a bitter divorce, you know. Sign, yeah, signing yeah. the paperwork. Who's who's going to get what? <laughs> I think I think we were all the kids in that divorce, exactly. so we just persevered. You know. <laughs> well, now, now you did uh, Robbie Sinclair. Were you the mouth for Robbie? Uh, I did the mouth. I did the mouth and and some of the facial features. Okay, it's quite a complicated uh, rig that we had that allowed us uh, to be inside of this mechanical glove called I think they called it a Waldo. We certainly called it a Waldo at some point, and every finger could be programmed through a computer okay. to be customized by the puppeteer. So if I wanted his eyes to be on this finger and another puppeteer wanted an eye blink or an eye move on the, this finger, you could do that. So I'm assuming uh, it's very similar to how they worked the turtles in the first yeah. two movies. 
I think, yeah, very similar. And it was very similar technology. I think it might have been a bit more complex yep. by the time we got there with that. So, and then you did uh, Bradley Richfield, which is the the owner of the We Say So Industries. Uh, now, yeah, he, he very, he, he was very just, big, large puppet. Yeah, massive thing. He what was, did you do with, with him? He was as big as this frame I'm sitting in right yeah. now. He was, you know, oh, well, bigger. His hands were, uh, yeah, he was massive. And it took two other people to do his hands because he was so big. Wow. So I was running the face and the head and the body movement. It was this, it was like driving a truck. <laughs> I, I had this big handle that I held. I mean, the head was, was this big and my hand was hold, was steering this thing kind of moving the head around. And my other hand was the bottom jaw. And I loved doing it. I mean, I would, I didn't have to really put a lot of effort into the voice if I didn't want to, Yeah. but I had to because it was the only way to get the character out. It's true. So I was just bellowing this character out. <laughs> And between takes, he was incredibly blue and crude. And I mean, we had <laughs> su such fun on the set. He was, he was so mean. Uh, he was mean in the show too, but, yeah. but when, between takes, he was really mean. <laughs> Can't imagine. And the crew loved it and everybody loved it. We had a great time and, you know, we'd crack up. <laughs> and, and speaking of sets, that's one of the best looking sets I've ever seen on TV. Oh yeah. It, it's pretty incredible. It was uh, uh, just a massive soundstage at what is now uh, CBS Radford Studios over in Studio City okay. in California. Uh, at the time, I think it was still MTM, which was Mary Tyler Moore's studio wow. um, for years. And that, that coincidentally is the studio where we shot and were based for the original Muppet movie. Oh. So at the time, a lot of the back lot areas were still there. So when we weren't shooting dinosaurs. You know, we could all go. I could take people on tours <laughs> of the... Now, that's where we shot Kermit on the lawn. Wow. Reaction, you know? Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so there is a question I like to ask every now and then on the sure. show. Since you you have been with a certain character or any characters, there's been Rizzo since what, early 80s, late 70s is when Rizzo yeah, came Rizzo out? Yeah, Rizzo happened about 19, uh, late 78. Okay, and then you were Kermit for many, many years. Yeah. Was there ever a time where you had a weird dream about a character that you performed? Since oh, you're wow. so attached to them all 24 seven sometimes. Uh, yeah, a few things, a few things. Well, one, one weird, I mean, it's, I don't know how weird it is. It's just when we, when we were shooting Fraggle Rock, you probably know Fraggle Rock. Of course, of course. I was doing this character called Wembley Fraggle. Yep, one of my favorites. Other things. And we were working really hard, really long hours, just really working hard. I mean, you know, late, late, crazy hours. And I was loving every minute of it. I was in my early 20s and I had a lot of energy and just loving it. And the standard thing before each take is that the floor manager, you know, they need a moment to see the characters on camera before they roll, you know, roll tape. And back then it was tape. And yeah. um, so the floor manager would say, okay, puppets up. And we would all put hold the puppets up, and we'd be in our position. We'd just hold them up so the camera guys, everything's lighting, checking, everything's good. So we were constantly doing that, arms in the air. I at least once, and I think several times, in the middle of the night, dreamt that I heard somebody say "puppets <laughs> up," and I hit the headboard of the bed. I did it at least once, hard enough to hurt my hand. Um, so crash and woke my wife up, and it was you know crazy. Um, <laughs> So I don't exactly know what I was dreaming, but I was, I, I do know that I was working 24 seven on that show. Uh -huh. I mean, it was just around the clock in my head. I never was not on the set of Rebel Rock, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that counts as a weird, bizarre dream. It's of... <laughs> pretty weird. It's pretty weird. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about current work. Um, sure. What's going on nowadays? I know you're doing the Weldon, the IT guy, which I watched, like I said, last oh, night's cool. live stream. And I loved it, man. That was a good show. Well, I have fun with this guy. He, he came about for a couple of reasons. I was, um, I was, in a way, I was looking for something small and simple to do, which really had, it, it actually, it has no budget. I mean, anything that has to be paid uh -huh. for, I just do. Um, and I wanted to come up with a character that worked well for the internet. So I thought, well, it could be anything, but gee, how about a troll? Uh, I know what that's like, because I was trolled uh, in the past. So I thought, <laughs> well, that could be fun. And I went around and around on how edgy is he? How do, does he go? Does he use four letter words a lot? Does yeah. he, what does he do? Cause you could do anything on the internet. And about the time we, you know, this has been going on since August a year ago, 2018. And I thought, so we can do anything we want. Um, but I read an article on the internet about that time frame where, where parents were saying, 
there was a lot of stuff showing up on children's uh, internet channels, places yeah. people yeah. thought were safe. Exactly. There were actually people were taking these characters and doing really bad stuff for kids on there, you know, for other words and crude yep. humor and sexual stuff. And I thought, well, you know what? I could do that, but let's not. Let's just not do that because I, I'm my name is still associated with the Muppets, and yeah. and people would not expect me to do that. And so, even if they're teenagers, let's let's just not do that. So Weldon is pretty PG. Um, you know, we keep him pretty PG. We, we're, I'm no more suggestive with Weldon than I would have been with Kermit, really. You know, you. I mean, I I stopped short of getting carried away, <laughs> and. Uh, He's fun, you know, uh, as you know, he's this internet troll and he actually is a troll species as well. And he lives in a cave by himself. And the point of his show is to have you call in and tell him about your misery uh, because he loves misery. And of course, for him, you know, misery loves company and he's the company. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> now, these, these people that call in, they the ones last night seem like regulars. I have regulars. I and, and and thank God I have regulars because, you know, I've done a couple of shows where we had no callers and it was like, <laughs> oh, what am I gonna do? Yeah. Um, you know, I have to have to fill. But but I, I love the regulars. I love our regular people. We have a they've almost become the cast of the show. Uh -huh. And it's nice when we get new people because there's new stuff to talk about. And uh, I can quiz them and and it's you know, it feels fresher in some ways. But it's it's kind of fun to check in with the with the old crowd, you know. And I'm sure they get a kick out of it, man, because just to be part of a almost Muppet experience, you know? It's close. It's very close. I mean, my my mentoring and my style of humor is very much like Jim's earlier work and yep. the work that I was a part of. And that's what I love and that's what I know and that's what I want to do. And, um, you know, we do these production numbers in the middle of the show. Yeah. Uh, where Weldon plays all the parts. He claims to be a cosplayer. So he plays all the roles. Um, you know, so, so we do stuff like that. I do all the music for that. And, and, you know, it's, I've got one puppet, so we shoot green screen and I, <laughs> it's really interesting though. It, I, one of the things I love about this is the challenge. Cause I do the editing as well. Wow. So, so I'm shooting two different puppets at two different times and trying to edit these two puppets. So it looks like they're being done simultaneously uh -huh. or sometimes more than two. I mean, you know, we, we've done, we did a stranger things, uh, parody. <laughs> Uh, last Octo October, a year ago, okay. that was five characters on screen at a time. Wow! Look at you, all all welded and all me, and we just, <laughs> you know, it, it was it was a, it was an editing challenge. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> and when it comes to the puppet himself, you created that. Uh, all the, everything really. This this whole show is me. So if you hate it, it you hate <laughs> me. Uh, I mean, I've got some help from a young man named Liam Nelson who has his own small production company. He's a very young guy. He's just starting out in the in the business. Uh, and he is sort of the person running all the tech. And then my wife, Melissa, who has done a, a, a quite a bit of puppeteering with the Muppets over the years as sort of a, a, a more, an extra sort of puppeteer, an assistant mm -hmm. puppeteer, mostly. Uh, she helps out with the puppeteering. So it's really the three of us. And I write the material and then I send it to a guy named Jim Lewis, who's one of the longtime Muppet writers. Um, I think of Jim as being... I don't know whether you know who Jerry Jewell was, but he was the head writer yep. of The Muppet Show, yep. one of Jim's original people. Uh, worked with Jim for years. And I think of Jim as sort of the next Jerry Jewell who came along Okay. Uh, in terms of his Muppet sensibility. But Jim, I'll bounce it off of Jim, and he uses it, takes a little bit of time and polishes the script and adds some jokes and, you know, does what a writer does. That's, I don't really think of myself as a writer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, lo I love the show, and I, I subscribed yesterday, and... I'm going to start watching. I need to call in too at some point. Yeah, I, you should. You should. It'd be, it would be great. I, you know, I hope everybody listening to your podcast would at least once, you know, nobody does appointment television anymore, but if you can show up at, we usually do the last Friday night of every month. Okay. So generally it's the last Friday of every month, whatever that is. Um, we're taking Christmas off 2020. Yeah. Uh, although that is the last Friday, we're going to live stream something that, I'm pre-shooting, but it's going to look like it's live stream. It'll okay. be fun. Okay. Uh, something people can run behind them their day while they're uh, doing presents. Yeah. But 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 if you have a chance to pop in, absolutely, call in and 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 uh, you know if your listeners would do that, that's great. It's nice to get people with uh, and and show up with something miserable to talk about. You can make it up, <laughs> but but give Weldon something to play off of. You know? Oh, it's gonna be so much fun. I'm looking forward to that. So so January, <laughs> listen to me in January then. <laughs> okay. All right. We're good. We're good. And where can people find the show at? 
the show we we stream on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel that's called Cave In, Cave Slash In. Um, if you go to YouTube and search Cave In, you'll find it. But there actually are some other Cave In related things. The best way to find it on YouTube is to search the character's name, Weldon the IT guy. Okay. And it'll pop right up. And I'll put and all the shows are there. We we have playlists that show all the. You know, if you don't want to watch these hour long shows, which some of them are pretty interesting, but we've got a playlist that's just the the two to three minute production numbers. So those are kind of fun. Gotcha. To watch. So you got the Baby Shark one from last night up then? <laughs> it's up. It's up. I discovered uh, Instant Premiere on YouTube. So you can, oh. I have it set to go up a half hour after we stop the show. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't need to look that up. I didn't know that even existed. It's very cool. Yeah. I just, it's like two shows ago after a year of, you know, trying to put these uh -huh. things up quickly. I, uh, I, can, I can now put that up and it huh. automatically goes up for me. Wow. So uh, yeah. what else is up with you nowadays? No conventions well, happening right now? I'm, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm at home, which is fantastic. I haven't done that for most of my life. Mm -hmm. I'm also developing a couple of other ideas, which are, I can't really talk about them quite yet, okay. but a couple of bigger show ideas with people I've worked with in the past who um, worked on other shows with me. And so, you know, I don't know whether any of those will happen. They're much bigger and much more complicated but very, very much like the Muppets, only a new take on things, a, new, a different okay. direction, the direction I might have liked to have taken the Muppets. Um, different types of characters, not, not fleece and foam necessarily. And uh, just what I think would be very cool things to do with puppetry, the kinds of things that I might expect Jim to be wanting to do if uh -huh. he was still around. You know, one of the things that was going on at the end of Jim's life, he had begun to talked to me pretty extensively about ideas. And we were talking, to, none of this is, was talked about because these are things that have happened since then, but yeah. we were starting to talk about sort of methods, you know, ways to do things, ways to create new things. And so I have some sense of extrapolating out the kinds of things I think he might have been trying to do. Hmm. And nobody's doing it. Nobody's doing wow. the things that he would have done. Not, not in my opinion. Yeah. Um, you know, not really the Muppets, and I don't see it anywhere else. So I'm kind of going in, in a direction that feels right to me. Awesome. Having, having sort of channeled Jim for a lot of years, I, I, I'm kind of trying to take that to the next stage. So I, I don't want to sound rude or anything, but it sounds like what happened with you and Kermit was a blessing in disguise, honestly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny. There's always a silver lining to these things, you know. Um, I, I regret it in some ways for Kermit because yeah. I feel a great responsibility. And those characters, it, they, they never, since Jim's death, they never have quite been treated no. in a way that treated them as though they were individuals. And yeah. I think that's super key. You know, everybody's well-meaning, everybody loves the characters, but I think of them as actually being almost, I mean, I know they're puppets, of course, I've been doing this a long time, but, but there's a certain way that I need to look at them in order to function with them that, sees them as living, breathing entities in the world. Yep. Uh, and I think that's how they need to be treated. Absolutely. Uh, but and at the same time, at the same time with these classic characters, they really, it's what we talked about with evolution. They need to be based on knowledge of the originators. Yep. Uh, super important. Yep. I agree. Uh, anything else? Um, any social media that you want to shout out? Sure. I can give you all my stuff. You know, Let's do it. three years ago, if you said this, I'd have said, oh, gee, I'm not really doing that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I've got, I've got a, a new website I put up, which is pretty interesting. It's very easy to remember. It's stevewitmire.website. Dot website. So it's not dot .com or dot .net, yeah. it's dot .website. Yes. My name, dot .website. <laughs> and it's kind of interesting for Muppet fans. I, at least I hope it is. There's a lot of history on there. You can reach me there. Uh, and, I, and I've got a blog there where I'm just starting the process of doing blog posts uh, mostly based on people's questions that they ask me on the site. Okay. Uh, so if, pe if people have Muppet questions, I'm trying to answer them so that the community can see them. Uh, but you can find that there. Uh, Instagram is a big place for me. Uh, it's Steve underscore Whitmire. Okay. Uh, and that's where I usually notify people about Kaven, okay. about what's going to be on the show and stuff like that. If I'm at Comic Cons, we talk about it there. Uh, I get a lot of requests for autographs. And uh, I'm kind of doing those through the con promoters, the Comic Con promoters. Yep. Um, especially during COVID times, I think it's I think it's nice. Uh, we all benefit from it. You know, they get a little bit from the fans out of it, and it's a nice way to go. 
Um, yeah, didn't you so just do people, one with GalaxyCon? Was did you do something with GalaxyCon? I did. I, yeah. I've done a couple. I've done a number of things. I really like GalaxyCon along with others, but GalaxyCon is is a very classy uh, outfit. Uh, Mike Broder's group is fantastic there, um, and I'm going to do probably others as well. But they also are great because they're very, very, very good. If people either want autographs or want to send in items to get yeah. autographed the promoters are handling that end of it. So I'm not running this cottage industry, which yeah. is really hard. <laughs> so if people want autographs, that's the way to get it. And the pricing um, is actually very good. It's the same price as you would get at a convention. It was, you, yeah, don't, you don't have to pay for a hotel, for food, for flights, right. you know, so right. it's really a win-win. I, I think it's, I think it's quite good. And it's, it's the, the, the best choice for the times. Yeah. And I, you know, I look forward to being able to go back to comic cons. I do. I enjoy them very much. Um, the travel's fun and meeting the other celebrities. You know, you meet some great celebrities at comic Cons. Lou Ferrigno, <laughs> you know, the Incredible Hulk and um, Henry Thomas, you know. Uh, I mean, these yeah. people from your past. Just I know. Amazing. Yeah, I just I mean, started. I, I, know, I know Brett, I won, uh, I won quite well. Mickey and, Mouse, yeah. But we see each other at comic Cons. We get to have dinner, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just started to go into them a couple of years ago and I'm adoring them as well. So hopefully yeah. we get to go to the same convention at some point so I get a chance to meet oh. you. That would be awesome. Absolutely. I hope to see you there. That'd be great. Of course. And uh, again, Steve, thank you so much for your time. I, When I was a kid, I was an um, aspiring puppeteer myself. Oh, so wow. it's amazing having you on and talking about your experiences. Hey, there's always time, you know. I know. You're, you're, I know. You're still a young guy. It's funny. <laughs> I, I did it. I did it for my church. Um, okay. So probably for about two years. And yep. my character was Carlos. So talk about whitewashing a character. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I'm like the, the whitest Irish guy you ever meet. But uh, I love <laughs> I love doing it. I love making the kids laugh. I used to have him up there. He had like crazy hair, about this tall hair. Yep, yep. And uh, I used to just lick, put his hand in his mouth, lick his tongue, and slick his hair back. And all the kids just laugh every time <laughs> I did it. Well, you know, I, I should tell you, I, uh, real quick, I, the, the earliest stuff that I did when I was a teenager, I was just looking for outlets, anywhere to perform. And a lot of it for me was was at a church I was attending, yeah. uh, the children's church, you know. Exactly. And we really did like a kid show every week. I mean, we had the guy who was the sort of the, the pastor guy who ran that. And then there was me with my puppets behind my little puppet wall. And he came over and we talked to the puppets. And of course, there was a religious message. But I, I would have done it whether there was or not. And then we had the kids like an audience. It was very much like a children's TV show. Yep. We did once a week, you know. Yep. Same with us. I think it's once a week we did. Yeah. It. We, we pre-recorded it. So we'd meet like the day before around a recorder oh, wow. with a microphone and record our lines yeah. and then just oh. played it out in front of the kids. And I loved it. Very cool. Well, if I ever meet you and you still have the puppet, bring it around. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I do cool. have, I do have the audio. I saw, I kept all the audio from oh, the, fantastic. uh, yeah, maybe someday I'll share that on the podcast. <laughs> hey, you know, you're, all you gotta do is get down on the floor and you know, you could right now you could be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, again, thank you so much. It's been an honor. And like I said, hopefully I get a chance to meet you one day. I hope so too. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it.